So there's also a controversial plan to introduce vaccine passports. In spite of opposition from some lawmakers in France, the project hasn't been dropped. It would effectively mean that people would have to carry a card approving their vaccination status in order to access certain places. It does raise a number of uh, issues. Françoise Bélis joins us, philosopher at Dalhousie University. Francois, good evening to you. Uh, in France, this is a very uh, touchy issue. In fact, officially, uh, it's been shelved uh, over the fear of outcry uh, over personal freedom uh, and such issues. Uh, though that coming from Olivier Véron, the health minister before Christmas. But it's still around as a concept. What's your opinion? Well, I think we need to recognize it's a very complicated issue. And it also comes with a lot of benefits, but I would say more harms than benefits at this time. Transport groups, I'm thinking of the International Air Transport Association, they're actually for it. They see it as a good idea. And of course, um, there's, there's a law in France that makes the airlines, um, uh, makes them, requires them to actually get people to have a test before they fly. That, that's in existence already. It's a precedent. Yes, and there are other precedents too that make it such that I can believe that in the near future we will in fact require some kind of vaccine certification for flying. We've had that in the past with yellow fever. The difference here right now is we don't actually have vaccines widely available. So if you were to introduce this today, it would mean who could travel? Pretty much nobody. At a certain point in time, once vaccines are reasonably accessible, I do think you will see this introduced for the airline industry. And as I said, there's a precedent for that. I think the thing that people are most worried about is not what might happen with air traffic, but rather whether this is going to become a platform for all kinds of biological information. And I think a lot of people have been arguing for that. They've been arguing, let's have this card so that you can get access to certain workplaces, so that you can go to the sports arena, so that you can go to the cinema. And then I think you're starting to see why people are a bit worried about privacy issues. And that kind of profiling, as you say, um, it's, it's not exactly um, foolproof, is it? Because, you know, one can be a negative one day, two days later, a day later, even an hour later, you can catch the virus. Well, I think this is also, again, one of the reasons why in the short term, I don't think it's a viable option. Right now, we have this vaccine rolling out. We have very limited supply of vaccine in most countries. And on top of that, at this point, the science tells us very little. What do I mean by that? We do believe, based on the data from the clinical trials, that at least with the current vaccines, you're looking at 95% efficacy. But that's with respect to whether or not you will become ill once you've had the vaccine. We don't actually have any robust data about transmissibility. So you could, in fact, be vaccinated. You could be asymptomatic. And you could, in fact, still be transmitting the virus. So for any kind of vaccine certification to be truly effective, we need answers to some scientific questions. And we also need a lot of answers to privacy questions. What are the parameters? What are the constraints around this kind of documentation? And how do we make sure that we don't, in fact, introduce huge, huge problems of discrimination? And that discrimination is going to be at two levels. You mentioned at the beginning, you know, people would be given a card. We expect people will be given a card to come back for their second vaccination. But people are actually talking about a digital passport. And there you're introducing all kinds of problems in terms of access. Not everybody has a smartphone, but also not all governments have the ability to work with that kind of technology on a daily basis. It's interesting you bring up uh, smartphones, Francoise, because um, the issue of privacy, of course, and, and, and one of these things that, you know, I'm waving around a smartphone in my hand right now, which probably says that someone knows exactly where I am. And this is one of the issues, isn't it, about privacy, where we, we can talk about one thing uh, whilst holding one of these in our hands and being tracked by any number of people. Right. But at this point in time, that fancy computer in your hand doesn't have, for example, all of your genetic information. And... That's what I meant when I said it's likely or possible that people are very concerned about this new technology being developed for something that everybody wants, which is perhaps some data around their status with respect to whether or not they can infect people with this virus. And then tomorrow it might be another virus, et cetera. But is it going to be a platform such that it's no longer vaccine certification? It's a biological passport. And when you start dividing up the world on the basis of biology, I think you're going to see huge risks in terms of discrimination, in terms of marginalization, etc. If it becomes a passport for everything, 
how is it going to be used and who's going to benefit, who's going to lose? Does this create different types of uh, discrimination or does it reinforce those that already exist in our society, do you think? Well, I think at the very least, it'll reinforce the kinds of discrimination we already have. As to whether it will introduce new forms of discrimination, I think so. And that's why I gave the example around genetics. And a number of countries have, in the last 10 to 15 years, been introducing legislation to try to protect people in terms of genetic privacy. Why? Because they can anticipate problems. You know, is this going to affect your ability to access certain health care, certain kinds of insurance, whether it's life insurance or mortgage insurance? How is this going to affect your relationship with your employer if they've decided that, you know, perhaps you are at risk in terms of, you know, financial obligations they might have towards you? So the question is, who ultimately is going to control this information and who's going to have the legitimate right to demand access to this information? Will it be law enforcement? Will it be the government? Will it be the doctor? Will it be the public health official? Um, those are important questions, and we need answers to those long before we would introduce any kind of widespread um, kind of you know, biological passport. And, and notice I, I'm saying biological passport because that's much broader than what people talk about, which is vaccine certification. But that could just be sort of the thin edge of the wedge. We start with that, looks like it's okay. And we end up somewhere where it's deeply problematic. Indeed, where is the line drawn? The Conseil Constitutionnel here in France uh, saying that such types, a type of a passport uh, will become obsolete as the vaccine is rolled out and taken. So there's clearly a, a bit of grey area there. Uh, the EU, or rather the European Commission president, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, kind of looking like she's for it, saying uh, there is a case for it, but it's really a political and a judicial issue too. That kind of tallies with what you're saying, I think. Absolutely. And as I said, I think you will see pressure for this, at least with respect to travel between countries. And the reason you will see that pressure is because we have a well-established precedent with yellow fever. You are required in certain parts of the world, if you want to go there, that you be able to provide proof of vaccination. And so in this context, you could legitimately imagine that countries will say, if you want to cross our border, you will need to provide this proof of vaccination. That's likely to tally with the interests of people who, in thinking about getting into this metal tube uh, that could be a cesspool, that they might want to know that everybody else sitting in that metal tube um, has been vaccinated. So there's going to be a bit of push and shove and interest in both directions, top down, bottom up. So I think you will see something like this for travel. Indeed. I, I flew quite recently, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was for work, uh, otherwise I wouldn't have gone. And um, I had to fill in a form, uh, I had to get a test uh, to prove that I was negative, and I still am negative. Uh, fingers crossed that remains that way. Um, but I was raising questions to myself on the flight as to whether my fellow passengers had taken the same precautions, uh, whether they were telling the truth on their forms, because we were just filling them in by ourselves, actually on our seats. Um, there is a need, I think, to be tighter in terms of how these things are looked at. Um, and that comes back to what you've just said about the idea that this is going to actually be enforced on the travel industry first, but you feel that... Well in society, it shouldn't be something that happens as, as, as something that is obligatory or something that is accepted. Right. Well, I think the travel industry is actually pushing for it rather than experiencing it as being forced on them. And the reason I say that is because their business model is such that they're losing, bleeding money. And the only way that they can see to restart the business and save it is to be able to provide assurances to fellow passengers. It's a safe place to be. And so they see that as actually an important tool to restart their business. Individual countries that are trying to control the spread of the virus also see this as potentially valuable in terms of not bringing in virus and then having community spread. I think the thing where I have huge reservations is when it's not limited to that very narrow purpose, which is safe passage from one country to another. It's when you start talking about it for all kinds of social reasons that I think then you're really opening up questions of discrimination. And I think you need to think about the fact that not everybody's going to have easy access to the vaccine. In some places it will be free, in some places it will be costly, in some places it will require technology. I gave the example of a smartphone that you have to be able to have to display it. And I think those are the kinds of things we need to think through. What are going to be the limitations? Who has the right to demand information from you? And can you control that information? 
I think that matters tremendously. Indeed, and if it's on a smartphone, as you say, then, you know, not everybody has access to a smartphone. There are many countries where people can't afford them. Let's not forget that. Francoise, we could talk a lot longer, but sadly, time against us. Thank you very much indeed for uh, reasoning, reasoning that through so clearly as to about why you have reservations uh, about uh, this idea of a uh, vaccine passport. And, of course, uh, we here at France Today will continue uh, to bring you all developments on the story. Francoise, once again, thank you very much indeed. Francoise Bayless, philosopher at uh, Dalhousie uh, University there, speaking to us from Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada. We